You know, as, of course, we are in the Lent season, and many of the sermons that we hear, you know, during Lent time are all, you've, you've heard them a lot. Uh, you know, we, we go over a lot of different things, and uh, we talk about a lot of different things, but, but you've heard them a lot. I mean, year after year, honestly, many of you have heard, you know, 50, 60, 70 years of, of Lent sermons, and you've, and you've recognized them pretty much almost by heart at this point in time, and so I wanted to kind of switch up a little bit today, and I wanted to talk, you know, as we think about, you know, some of the things in, um, that we think about during the triumphant entry, you know, I wanted to talk about some other things that we might not talk about or think about. You know, there are some really great stories in the stories of Lent season and certainly the triumphant entry, and, and I want to talk about something that probably seems insignificant, uh, talk about a person who we don't even know his name, quite frankly. I want to talk to you today about the story about the donkey owner. The donkey that Jesus rode in on, you know, Palm Sunday, he rode in on. I want to talk about the donkey owner today and, and the story. You'll, you'll recognize the story, but I'm going to take it from a little bit different turn today. So here's the story. It's called the triumphant entry. And, of course, we're moving up to Easter. And it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, I want you to go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, with no one, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell them the Lord needs it. So those who were sent ahead, talking about the disciples, went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt or the donkey, its owners asked them, why are you untying our donkey? They replied, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. I think that a good question to start with, you know, when if I, I'm thinking about this story this week as we're preparing this message, and I got thinking about, you know, a good question to start with on this case would be, why did the owners of the donkey loan him out? I mean, you know, I, I, I thought about things this week about my own ideas about maybe why, and maybe it was, you know, maybe it was just good old, you know, Eastern hospitality. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. It could have been that. I mean, especially during Passover. Of course, we know during Passover, we, we recognize that it gets really, really crowded in Jerusalem. And people show up, and they can't bring everything that they need. And maybe, just maybe, you know, they, they loaned this donkey out for that reason, just to, just to be kind to somebody. They loaned them the donkey for, you know, maybe a period of time, a common courtesy. Possibly, and that could have been the case. I mean, or maybe it was because of the fact that you know, uh, to loan out a a donkey to a to an distinct, distinguished rabbi might have been a pride thing. You know, uh, you know. Of course, we as we know, Palm Sunday and all that went on. You know, during that period of time. I mean, uh, the, of course, it was it was like an atmosphere full of all of these people who were in Jerusalem, and it was a party like atmosphere, a parade like thing, and. And, you know, and, and as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem to uh, get to Palm Sunday, you know, maybe they, they thought about that and said, you know what, I, you know, he, they're standing in the crowd and they said, that's my donkey there. He's riding my donkey. Look, that's my donkey. You can tell that's my donkey there. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. I mean, the Bible doesn't really say. I mean, some other people suggest, you know, if you read your commentaries and and stories about Jesus and about this situ situation. Perhaps Jesus had arranged for the use of this donkey in a prior visit to Jerusalem. Maybe he had already talked to the owners of this donkey and, and maybe they had some kind of a password, which in this case may have been the master needs it or the, or the, or the, you know, the, the Lord needs it. So maybe they had already had reached an agreement you know, beforehand that, that this donkey was part of this agreement. I don't know. The Bible doesn't really say. Possibility number four, however, is what I believe to be true. I believe that they loaned the donkey to Jesus because they saw him as their master. When they said the master needs it, they saw them as their master. I believe they loaned the donkey to him because of that reason. You know, why are you untying the donkey, they ask in verse 33. Why are, you know, if you can imagine, you need, let's just say you're at your house, you look out your front window, and all of a sudden you see somebody grabbing something off your property. 
That's kind of what was taking place here. You know, they, they, they saw them. It's like, you're untying my donkey. They run out and say, why are you untying my donkey? I mean, can you imagine how you would feel if you saw somebody doing that? You'd probably call 911. You know, uh, yeah, that's probably what you would do. They go, they go out. They see it going on. They go out. They say, why are you untying my donkey? But once it was stated the master needs it, the discussion was over. They didn't say, well, what does he, you know, what, why? You know, anything more. They didn't say, the Bible doesn't say one more word about it. Oh, they must have said, my master needs it. The master needs it. I think that if they had given the donkey for any other reason than the master needs it, I think that there would have been a lot of questions asked. Personally, that's what I would think. I mean, can you imagine, you know, seeing that in your case? I mean, if you had a donkey and they're untying your donkey and you didn't know really even, you never met these two disciples before. You probably didn't even know that they were disciples. I mean, if it had been me, I would have asked questions, wouldn't you? If somebody came to my house to untie my donkey, I didn't know them, I would ask them a bunch of questions, probably. One of them would be, how long are you going to need my donkey? I mean, how long are you going to need it? Where are you going to take my donkey? How do I know that you're going to take care of my donkey? I mean, when are you going to bring my donkey back? I mean, I would ask, you need to sign an agreement. I need something in writing that tells me you're going to bring my donkey back and take care of my donkey. That's what I would have said. I'm sure that's what I would have said. You know, I rent stuff every once in a while in my construction business. I have to go to Rentals Unlimited or, or Jefferson Rentals, and they ask all those questions. How long are you going to keep it? You know, when are you going to bring it back? Where are you taking it to? What are you going to use it for? And oh, by the way, you're going to sign this agreement. Absolutely true. I could see right now if I back my truck up to something that I needed hooked up to, and I started driving off with it and said, oh, the master needs it. <laughs> well, since the owner didn't ask any of these questions, I think that the owners of the donkey had faith. Really, I think that's what's going on here. I think they had faith and they knew that they were waiting for a master. I also think that he came to the conclusion that applies to how God reacts to all believers, including us, you and me as well. And this is this. A true believer is willing to give what he has to the Lord. A true believer is willing to give what he has for the Lord. I don't know if the owner of this donkey had more than one donkey. You know, back in those days, most, many times they even shared donkeys. But I don't know if he had one or more. But back in that days, donkeys were very, very valuable pieces uh, of property to an owner. I mean, think about it this way. They were like a pickup truck back in those days. Right? They carried stuff all around. I don't know about you guys, but I can't hardly do without a pickup truck even one day. I mean, really, I, it, it causes me great concern when I don't have my pickup truck for even one day. They were called beasts of burdens. They also actually acted as tractors back in the day. Can you imagine a farmer without a tractor? Really, that's what they're doing. They, they're going there, they're untying this guy's tractor and driving off with his tractor. That's what they used them for. They used them as trucks. They used them as tractors. They used them as transportation. Can you imagine not having a car for just one day? Do you remember how inconvenient it is when your car breaks down just even for one day? It tends to make life difficult when we don't have these things in our lives. It was the same for these owners. It was the exact same thing for these owners. What I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make to you today was, you know, this was no small insignificant thing that's going on here. This is a big deal, a very big deal for somebody to give up their donkey. Donkeys, they were prized possessions back in the day, and oftentimes, like I said, one donkey was actually shared by many families. I mean, families that didn't have a lot, they literally shared donkeys. They, you know, two or three families had one donkey. And so if that was the case in this case, I don't know if it was or it wasn't, but if that was the case, think about it this way. Can you imagine that another one of the owners showed up, wanted to get their donkey, the donkey wasn't tied in the right spot, they go up and they talk to the person who loaned out the donkey and said, where are my donkey at? Where's my donkey at? And then the next question would probably be, you did what? You gave, you gave my donkey to somebody, two people that you don't even know at all? And then the questions would start again. Where is it going to? When, is it, when are they going to bring it back? How do we know they're going to take care of it? I would imagine this would have caused a great deal of concern and conflict among the owners of the donkey. 
But this is what the master needed, the Bible says. And so this is what the master got. That takes a leap of faith on this, on this guy, on this owner's or owner's people to take a leap of faith and say, well, the master needed it, so I'm going to let him have it. I'm going to trust that he's going to take care of it. I'm going to trust that he's going to bring it back. This was a big, big deal back in those days. Listen, God doesn't always ask for big things, but he never asks for any things that we can't give him. You know that God doesn't always ask for big things, but he never asks us for something that we can't give him. Oh, we may feel as if we don't have anything significant to give to him, but God takes the simple things in life and uses them in great ways. You say, where does it say that in the Bible? It says that in the Bible everywhere. I mean, all over the place. I mean, you think about Moses. Moses used a walking stick. He gave God a walking stick. You know, uh, King David, David gave God a slingshot. The widow, the widow that was with Elijah, think about what she gave. She gave her last bit of oil and flour. The young boy that we talked about last week, what did he have? He had five little tiny loaves, really pieces of pita bread, honestly, and two fish. And look what God did with that. Look what Jesus did with that. Fed 5,000 men plus women and children. The Bible is full of people who gave what they had, and God used it in unbelievable ways. So back to the donkey now. A true believer knows that whatever they have belongs to the Lord. A true believer knows that whatever they have belongs to the Lord. Listen, everything we have, everything you have, everything I have has, is a gift from God. It's as simple as that. You didn't get it on your own. You ain't that smart. You ain't that bright, and neither am I. Anything you have in life, God gave it to you. It's as simple as that. The Bible says in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from there. Every perfect gift comes from there. Everything we have has been given to us by, from God, every single thing we own. Our time, our talent, our resources, it's all been entrusted to us so that we might use it for him. It wasn't just given to us just for us to use on ourselves. I sometimes wonder what God thinks when he sees us wasting what he has given us. And I sometimes wonder what he thinks when he sees us using the gifts that he has given so that only just for ourselves. Or when he sees us squandering the gifts that he has entrusted us with, I sometimes wonder what God thinks. See if this sounds familiar to you as well. There are times in my own life when I sense God calling me or telling me or saying something to me about giving something, and sometimes I don't know for sure what it is, but, but what I do know is when that person has followed or has left, and it's like all of a sudden the light goes off, and it's like you just missed an opportunity. Ever done that before? I hate that. I hate that when I, when I, don't, I can't get the perfect feel for it and I don't know it, but what I do know is I should have spoken to them, I should have prayed for them, I should have said, you know, I'm this, I'm a Christian, I can do this, or help them in some way. I hate it when I miss that opportunity. There are other times, to be honest with you, where I've recognized the opportunity and I was too selfish to give it. Sound familiar? I was too selfish to give it. Other times I know what he wants me to give, and I give it, and I obey him, and I feel honored and privileged that he would use me. He would use me to help somebody else and to help Jesus get a little bit further down the road. And still other times I wonder if my little deeds make a difference in the grand scheme of all that goes on. Maybe you have the same questions as I do. I don't know. The truth is, is each of us has a donkey. What I mean by that is each of us has a donkey. We all have something in our lives which, if given back to God, could just like the donkey be used and move Jesus' story just a little bit further down the road for someone. You may be able to sing. You may be able to hug. You may be able to talk. You may be able to program a computer. You may be able to teach, watch children, write a check. Whatever it is, that's your donkey. That's what God has given you to further the ministry and to further the gospel. That's your donkey. And whatever it is, your donkey belongs to him. Absolutely it does. It belongs to him. You know, the original wording that Jesus gave to his disciples is proof. Jesus said in verse 31, If anyone asks you why you are taking the donkey, you are to say, Its Lord is in need. 
It's the Lord is in need of your gifts and your talents and your abilities too. How do you think he gets it done in this world we live in? You see, it's really not about the donkey. It's really about our attitude about the donkey. God has given us many things. He has given us talents and time and resources and children and jobs. They all belong to him. God has given them us as a gift for us to use, but he can also ask them back at any time. At any time, he can ask that what, we have, what he has been given to us be returned to him in some way or another because he is the true owner. We are simply the trustees of these gifts. And finally, the true believer knows that the value of what he has is multiplied when it's placed in the Lord's hands. You know, this man that gave his donkey, even though it was valuable to him, look at how much more valuable it became in the hands of the Lord. I mean, think about this. This guy was actually fulfilling, this donkey was actually fulfilling prophecy. This donkey was transporting the Lord of Lord, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this donkey and its owner have been re remembered for over 2,000 years because of what he did with that donkey. It was a simple act. None of this would have happened if he wouldn't have said yes, if he would have, would have not accepted the call that the master needed it. If we had the opportunity to speak to this man, he may have said, you know, it was no big deal, it's not that big a thing, but it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. The person who takes time to visit may feel as if, you know, it's not a great big deal, it's not, I'm not doing all that much. Won't they be surprised when they get to heaven? Won't they be surprised? The Sunday school teacher who labors, I asked Meredith earlier today, I kind of set him up, I guess, because I wanted to know how long he's been teaching Sunday school, and it's been way, way, way over 50 years. Won't he be surprised when he goes to heaven and he lives on a great street? And won't he be surprised at how many people are there because he taught Sunday school for all those years? The person who prays for others may feel as if, you know, I don't even know if my prayers are being answered, but they're being answered. You might not see it, you may see it, you may not see it, but I'm telling you, they are being answered and they are changing hearts and they are changing things when we pray. The person who takes the time to send a card, to make a visit, to stop by and talk to somebody, they say it's no big deal. But it's a big deal to encourage someone who is down. It's a big deal to, to comfort someone who is not doing very well, to, to reach someone who is drifting. It's a big deal. What we have is never more valuable than when we place it back in God's hands again to use for his glory. So here's the question. What is God asking of you? How can you invest what he has given to you and what does he want you to do to give? The talent, some, some time, some money, a willingness to obey. I can't tell you what it is. I don't know what it is in your life. It may be something simple. It may be something big. I don't know what it is. But what I do know is a true disciple of Christ gives what the master asks for. A true disciple of Christ gives what the master asks for. You know, there were two groups of people there that day. As Jesus gets on this dunk and he's, and he's starting to ride toward Jerusalem, quite frankly, towards his whole calling in life, there were two groups of people there that day. Remember, it was a, it was a, a huge, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are there, and they're lined up in the streets as he's going through, heading toward Jerusalem. There was the enthusiastic group there that day. Now, this group is the group of people who enjoy a show. They like being a part of the party. They, they like to be where the action is. But their main concern was not in following Christ that day. There's a procession going on. Let's go see what the heck this is all about. Let's see what, you know, see what this is going on here. And then there were the committed. These are those who trust Jesus to be their Lord. He is their true master of their lives, and, he, and when he commands them, they, they do. And when he asks them to go, they go. And when he asks them to give, they give. So which group are we? You see, the issue is the same this day as it was all the way back in the day of that donkey. It's the exact same thing. Jesus declares himself to be the long-awaited king that will reign over all of us if we will just trust him to do so. The declaration is the same. The choice is the same as well. 
Will we receive him as our Lord or will we just stand on the sidelines? You see, it really isn't about a man's donkey. It's really not about a man's donkey. It's really about a man's heart. That's what this story is really about. It's about a man's heart. Jesus said, tell them the Lord needs it. When they had heard this, they gave it. And when they gave that donkey, they were giving their very best, the most that they had to give. If Jesus were to come to you today and say, I'm in need of that, whatever it might be, would we give it? Would we give it? Would we surrender it to him just as these owners surrendered their donkey? Would we be willing for him to take it and use it for whatever he might feel it needs to be used for? Or will we hold on to it and keep it for ourselves? They said, whatever the Lord needs, if we have it, it's his. And so they gave their donkey. Can I ask you, what's your donkey? And what is Jesus asking you to do today? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today and for its truth. The truth is, is we all have a donkey. We all have something that you have given to us that sometimes you may ask back that we might use to get you a little bit further down the road. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of that fact and help us to be mindful of that before it passes over and say, darn, I missed that opportunity. Lord, remind us of that opportunity just when it gets there. And may we, just like this donkey owner, be faithful. In your precious name we pray. Amen.